Good afternoon. You're watching AB Live, a news chat show in which we discuss topics ranging from business, news, politics, and so much more. And today we are going to be talking about the Arab Youth Survey. And to discuss just that, we have the president of ASDA BCW, Sunil John. Thanks so much for joining us here, Sunil. Hi, Shruti. Good to see you. Likewise, so again, 12th edition of the Arab Youth Survey, we're all waiting for it and as always, great insights. What I want to ask you right now is, what were the key insights or the findings that stood out for you this, this year in terms of what was surprising, what was alarming, what was unexpected? Yes, uh, you know, for a, for a survey that we've been holding for the last 12 years, it is always a challenge to bring new findings that surprises people. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a scientific process when we actually structure our questionnaire, which we did in October of last year. Okay. Much before COVID became an impact. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that we, we looked at is the enormous amount of anti-government protests in certain North African and Levantine countries. Yeah. Almost so much that people called it Arab Spring 2.0. Uh, and these countries, as you know, Shruti, are Algeria and Sudan, uh, which, saw, which saw change in leadership. You yeah. know, Bouteflika, after nearly two decades, the president had to resign. Yeah. He wanted to contest the election, he had to resign. Yeah. And then, of course, President Bashir, after three decades in power, uh, is now in prison, actually. Yeah. And then, of course, the very violent protests in Iraq and in Lebanon, which actually in some of these countries still going on, yeah. and spreading in other parts of the region. So we thought that was a, a significant change in the way and the mood. Mm -hmm. And most of these protests were led by young people. Right. And so we chose that as, as and it, we introduced that question about, you know, what do young people want from uh, these protests? How do yeah. they, what was their real issue? Uh, and that's the finding that really jumped at us. When, right. we, when we reviewed the, looked at the findings in, in January and February and March when we were out on the field and, and when the data came in, we were taken by surprise that uh, nearly half of the Arab youth across these 17 countries yeah. wanted to emigrate. And, you know, when you, you're looking at 200 million young Arabs, Shruti, mm -hmm. and if nearly half of them want to leave, it means a lot of things yeah. to governments here. You know, it, it also means a lot of things to neighboring countries and neighboring continents. Yeah. Because there would be, there's already some pressure on the border, as you can see, uh, uh, in, in many of the European borders with the, with the region. So, uh, what is, uh, so that was what really jumped at us. Sure. Uh, and then when we further asked the question about why do, you, why, do you, why do young people want to protest, and it was clearly government corruption. Yeah. Uh, and what they are actually saying is lack of opportunity. You know, the, yep. the region has uh, the world's highest youth unemployment in, you know, in the world. Uh, ILO has said that it's 26%. Yeah. Uh, and now, with the pandemic, I'm sure that number has further worsened. Yeah. So those big socio-political issues of, of, uh, uh, of migration, of government corruption, and the increasing protests. And, and when we did the COVID survey uh, as recent as uh, August, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that have the have young people change their perspective on life, yeah. on their future, uh, we've seen that uh, they they have uh, the, these some of these issues have further worsened, where young people say there will be more protests. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a signal to the government. And as you know, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, Vice President, and Prime Minister of the UAE, actually tweeted he and I think one of the strongest statements from a statesman like His Highness where he said if these governments do not address the issue of the youth yeah. they will be ruined uh, I think that is a huge strong statement and a wake-up call for governments to address the issue of Arab youth Absolutely. I mean the youngest part of the world is here in the Arab world yeah you can either look at it as a youth dividend or you can uh, uh, the counter uh, view is is a, is a very uh, dim uh, uh, and will make grim reading as the report does uh, but you can use the opportunity to use the talent to to bring more progress in the country to get people to 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 be enterprising mm -hmm. 
uh, and then I, I think things could change. Uh, and that is, while you can look at it as a depressing result, but you can also look at it uh, as a message of hope, as the other findings have shown. Yeah, yeah, and it's also a cry or call for help, isn't it? Like, like you just mentioned, Sheikh Mohammed recently tweeted about it. So it's about governments in many countries not really investing in their most important resource, which is their youth. Uh, and that's what's happening, which is why the first point you mentioned about migration. So I just have this uh, on screen just for the reference of the viewers. So it said that young Arabs who are considering are actively trying to leave their country. So this is one thing about the migration. A lot of points on it. Uh, you can go to arabianbusiness.com to find out more about the survey. But let's just get into the migration aspect of it, right? So where do you think these Arab youth want to go to? Are they trying to move from uh, the Levantine countries or North Africa to the GCC? Or do they want to leave this region altogether? Yeah, that is one question we did not ask in the survey in terms of uh, where do these people want to go. Yeah. Uh, but as you can see in this graph, you can see that uh, out of the 42% of the uh, young people across the 17 countries, 63% come from the Levantine countries. Yeah. Uh, and it's not surprising because, you know, uh, and the highest is from Lebanon, okay. from countries like uh, Iraq, mm. from the Palestinian territories, sure. and also from Jordan, in fact. And uh, we have the, uh, the Yemen as part of that Levantine sample. So that's where the number comes high. But North Africa as well, about 47%, half of it, as mm -hmm. well but the lowest is in the GCC especially yeah. here in the UAE there's hardly anyone who wants to leave for obvious reasons yeah because the government has taken care of their needs their yeah. education needs their job needs and, and that's why GCC is the lowest uh, one can uh, I mean some of our uh, of our uh, people who've looked at the survey has probably wrongly deduced that they want to go to the UAE, but mm. that's not their destination for emigration. Yeah. Uh, and this is from the UAE, from the model nations finding where young people across the, re across the 17 countries look at UAE as a model nation. Yeah. A, a, a place they want to live in and, and the place that uh, they want their own countries to emulate. But not necessarily where they want to move to right emigrate. now. Emigrate yeah. is moving lock, stock and barrel yeah. uh, and, and setting up home and creating a family. Uh, they always see UAE as a place where they can get a job. Right. So I think uh, those, uh, probably in the next survey, Shruti, we will uh, we'll further investigate in, into this and look at what are their destinations. But sure. there are some, you know, like Canada and, and Australia and some of those destinations where you see a lot of Arab diaspora. Yeah. You know, Europe is a huge destination for yeah. them. And that's where the pressure on the European border, in terms of geography as well, right, to the Mediterranean Sea. And yeah. that's where most of these... But which is what I want to get at. So if these 42% of the youth, if they get what they really wish for yeah. and they decide to leave their countries, what's going to happen to the economies of both the, the countries they are from, the rest or the nationals of and the countries they want to move to like Europe like you mentioned yeah. what is it going to do in a, in a grander scheme of things correct in fact a further finding from the migration one is that we asked these 42 percent of these people who are actively looking at emigrating yeah. would you want to permanently move with no connection to your country yeah. or you want to keep a connection mm. 40% of those who want to go said we want to cut off from our homeland. Oh, wow. Now, that is a very dangerous sign because, yeah. you know, in certain countries like Lebanon and Syria, there are more, there is more a diaspora that lives outside of Syria and Lebanon, mm. which in many ways will probably invest in the reconstruction of these countries because they always keep a link to the homeland. Yeah. You know, but these people are going with absolutely no... Uh, uh, need to connect with homeland because you know they have seen that most of their homes and 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 their livelihoods have been destroyed yeah now that's a dangerous sign and I think governments need to look at seriously of how to you know get these people good jobs because what do young people need they want an opportunity to get on with life yeah they want a good quality education that keeps gets them ready for the jobs of the future yeah you know, these are young, intelligent people and, and, and really wanting to, get, to move ahead, to set up, uh, to get a job, to set up a family. But if, if, that's, if the basic necessities are not there, mm -hmm. you know, then you get into a situation which is called, you know, the, uh, uh, you know a, a future that is very dismal. 
yeah. uh, and you know a, a entire lost generation absolutely As some yeah. people have called this in this particular the last 10 years shruti has been uh, the most difficult in the uh, in the arab world and these young people have now been termed as a lost generation a term that comes from after the world war one where uh, the famous author gertrude strude actually looked at that as you know a generation that lived in in, in oddly enough in in great profligacy but here yeah. you're looking at a generation that uh, is is lost uh, all its basic needs yeah yeah and that was my next question actually to you do you think from all the people you've spoken to, from all the youth you've uh, interviewed or surveyed, do you think that they, they have a sense of loss in direction completely? That, you know, um, talking from a more political point of view, do you think that there is a higher pro possibility and probability of them taking or treading the wrong path, uh, just for the lack of better words at this point? Yeah. Uh, we had a message from uh, uh, Her, ex uh, Her Excellency, uh, Shamal Mazroui, the UAE Minister of Youth for uh, in the UAE, uh, and she basically looked at the results and mm -hmm. she said she sees more a message of hope. Okay. She sees young people. When you look at the employment uh, jobs finding, you see that young people are looking for non-traditional jobs. And mm. what are traditional jobs in the region? Most of the young people wanted a job in the government. Yeah. But the government is maxed out. They cannot create more jobs. Mm -hmm. Even the private sector, they are now seeing a, a little lesser in terms of trend. But there is a, a small surge of young people uh, wanting to uh, to be entrepreneurial, to, to work for themselves mm -hmm. or their family. Yeah. Now that she sees as a green shoot. Sure. And there are several other green shoots as well. I mean, if you look at the gender rights finding, for example, you know, you see young women uh, seeing that they have more, uh, equal uh, or in some cases more rights than men. Yeah. Uh, and that is not just in the Gulf, which we can see for sure in our daily lives. Yeah, yeah. equal wages now. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that's the new uh, the new d uh, decree from the federal government. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but also in North Africa and Lebanon as well, which are m much more comparatively, much more open uh, open societies. Actually. Sure. I'm going to get to gender rights in just a bit because we there's again sure. a lot to talk about that. But the, the point you mentioned before in terms of you know uh, the youth being green shoots correct the, the green shoots so you've said that there's a whole sense of entrepreneurship yeah. there and the youth are open to being you know self-employed etc but are the governments and are these countries also providing an environment for these youth who want to start their own businesses yeah. to you know help them set up yes I think in the past we have asked this question about if there are credit lines for young people yeah. to start their businesses and clearly as, as you know Shruti that that is one of the biggest problems uh, while the government makes most of these governments make uh, you know some bit of uh, cozy noises about oh we are there to support uh, but in actual effect when somebody wants to start a business mm. you, you're not being given the the required funds to be able to start that yeah so if, if governments don't take risk on these young people and give them a, an opportunity that helps them and their and their uh, future of their societies mm -hmm. then it becomes a problem and yeah. this is the message that is really coming from this survey yeah that that the government needs to have a single-minded focus yeah to be able to first of all focus on quality education a lot of young people are missing education yeah how do we bring them back into uh, uh, um, at least the basics of education to give them education that is required for the for, for the world we live in to, uh, in today mm. the future of jobs are in more in uh, in artificial intelligence and and so much of the new technology driven industries that we are living in today are these young people fit for the future so uh, quality education uh, and then creating an environment for more entrepreneurial jobs and providing them with credit lines mm -hmm. to be able to have the environment, to the enablement mm -hmm. to be able to create these, these uh, new enterprises. Once that happens, the young will have their own energy and that will be a transformational energy for this region. That's what we call the youth dividend. Mm. It's time this dividend paid off for the region. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think the governments have a responsibility to create that environment. And that's what, again, referring back to His Highness's quote, he was so strong enough to say that you, uh, the, he, he, he addressed the government, said that you are accountable for your actions, yeah. that you have to create this kind of enabling environment for these young people to move ahead. 
And once you channel that energy, Shruti, this region will be one of the best in the world. It will, because there is the demand, there is yes. the, the youth population, which is again, like you mentioned, it's one of the highest in the yeah. world. Yeah. But it's just that the governments uh, they probably need to, you know, up their game. Uh, the next point that I would like to touch upon is uh, the main issues that young Arabs uh, want their countries and their governments to tackle. And yes. clearly, government corruption is one of the key topics uh, that, that has come about in your survey. Yeah. Do you see that the youth in this region are politically active right now and they want to have a say in their own governments? I think, uh, uh, you know, if you look back at the earlier surveys of the year 2008, 9 and 10, mm -hmm. one of the top findings in, th in those years was young people across, the, the sample was smaller, of course, in the early years. Yeah. They said they wanted to live in a democratic country. Okay. And a lot of people didn't actually give the survey as much attention as they do today. Yeah. But if anybody was serious look, looking at that one main finding, mm -hmm. they would see the Arab Spring happening in 2011. Yeah. So some of these data and insights portends for what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. So look at this finding here. What are young people saying? Are they saying that they want to be part of the political process? They're actually saying very simply, give us an opportunity to progress. Mm -hmm. What is hindering their progress today? Government mm -hmm. corruption. And what is government corruption? There is this euphemistic term that is used in Arabic called wasta. Mm -hmm. What does wasta mean? It means a barrier to get to an opportunity. Unless you know somebody, you're not going to get those doors opened. Yeah. So if there is equal opportunity, everybody is given the chance to progress, to be able to get a credit line, to get a job in the government or private sector or to work for themselves, that is what they're saying. So this is not a political cry. This is a very simple, pragmatic, practical ask. Right. Can you open the door for us? And that's what, and look at this. We asked young people, the question was, in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. it's a 10 year perspective, what do you want the Arab world to do? Yeah. They are not talking about the well-paying jobs is the second one. Mm. And then, uh, then the other political requirements are below that. Yeah. But the first one is take the wasta off. Yeah. Give us equal opportunity. But is Vasta more of a cultural thing though? Uh, because again, Vasta is essentially, if you translate it, it's more like recommendation, uh, which is there across the world. But over here, it's more prominent and prevalent in almost every industry. So is that coming or stemming from a cultural sort of background? I think Vasta is there in, in all parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, but I think here, uh, it has been endemic with, uh, you know, the, some of the regimes that have been there for decades together. Mm. So you, you create what is called an elitist class yeah. in m many of these societies, and, and they uh, capture all the growth opportunities, yeah. leaving a vast majority of people below the poverty line. And, there, and that's where uh, most of these populous countries like Sudan, or even, in fact, Algeria, or Iraq, or mm -hmm. Syria, or any of these countries, there's this vast majority of young people below the poverty line who are saying, and this is what the survey is, a voice for change. Yeah. And they're saying, change these things. Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I think that's what this really means. Sure, so now from a macro it's level. Not, it's not a cultural thing. Right. It is an endemic uh, thing that has been built over several decades of, uh, of misrule, right. of lack of proper governance, of lack of transparency, yeah. and the youth, from what they're doing on the streets today, mm -hmm. they're going to change that. Could democracy be a solution then, according to you? Not democracy as defined by uh, the West. Yeah. They tried to do that in Iraq, you know, with the US invasion in 2003, but that didn't it work didn't out. work, it didn't yeah. work. So I think that there is, you can see uh, uh, the, the, Gulf, the, the Gulf countries uh, comparatively mm -hmm. are much more safe and secure. Yeah. There are young people who have opportunity. In fact, there's a vast majority of expatriates who also use these countries to actually progress in life. So you've seen a model that works. Yeah. And that model works in a, what is called a very tough neighborhood. Mm. So what stops the other countries from moving ahead? Because you have young, intelligent, educated youth. Yeah. Use those energies, give them the opportunity, and sure. you will see what they will do.
So we are again, uh, we're talking about a monarchy which has been a more successful sort of governance model than uh, that's essentially what has been shown in the survey and otherwise as well. So what is it that the, our neighbours, the Levantine countries and the North African countries can learn from this sort of governance model? Yeah. I think uh, uh, very, so many, so many uh, key lessons to learn, you know. I think uh, looking at, you know, proper governance, uh, looking at single-minded objective on, on the key aspects of uh, getting the young people ready for the jobs of the future. As I said, quality education. I yeah. think the education system here uh, has not uh, been modernized for, for decades together. Mm -hmm. In some countries, you still have uh, very, uh, uh, you know, kind of out of uh, tune education system. Some, yeah. in fact, still uh, work, uh, study in the religious mode as well. Right. So I think there's a lot to be done in, the, in that. Mm. Uh, and if you look at it, the openness, the ability to listen to people, to be able to create. Uh, in fact, what the survey does is brings the voice of people to these government. I think they need to listen to their people. Yeah. They cannot make government policies sitting in ivory towers without listening to the people. Government policy should be made from bottom up yeah. rather than top down. Yeah. And that's what this survey is trying to say. We bring evidence-based uh, uh, insights to governments to look at. And we put it out in a public forum. Any of these findings, you can go to our website, arabyouthsurvey.com. Mm -hmm. And we see increased interest, Shruti, from all of these governments. We, uh, we actually do uh, special briefings for governments here in the Gulf. Uh, we have briefings in certain countries in North Africa and Levant. And we go to, you know, even the IMF and the World Bank annual meetings actually invite us to present these findings. Oh, wow. Okay. To, you know, last year I was there in Washington, D.C. as well, presenting the findings. And this Thursday we are uh, we're doing a special webinar for audiences in the U.S. And next week we'll be... Uh, we'll be doing another webinar for audiences in Europe as well. Sure. So the survey is also not only for governments here, mm. but also for multilateral organization when to gain better understanding yeah. of this region. And as we know, data is the new oil, and you are providing the data that everybody needs, so that's great. Uh, but from a macro level, just bringing it to the micro individual level, sure. uh, that's another thing that you found out about personal debt uh, among Arab youth. Yes. So this slide was quite interesting for me because the leading cause of debt in GCC is car loans, but then you look at the other regions, it's uh, student loans in the other regions. Yes. So it just sort of shows that in the GCC we have more of a debt culture where we want to buy things out of comfort and luxuries. Right. And in the, in the other regions, it's more of a need. It's a necessity that they're trying to cater to. Sure. So let's talk about the UAE for now. There is a debt culture which has been there for a really long time. Yes. Do you think there, again, is a need coming from the youth that they want want this culture or to get rid of this culture where they don't want to be in debt for the rest of their lives and just lead peaceful uh, lives without worrying about their finances. Yeah. Is that something you noticed? Yeah. I think debt is, is not a wrong thing to have. I think if, if, uh, if a, a student or the family uh, wants to take a student loan, uh, that is a great way to actually invest in your future. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong taking a student loan. Uh, uh, but when debt uh, percentages increase, as we've seen, yeah. uh, then as we've seen in 2020 and with the pandemic, uh, uh, COVID pandemic, it's increased even further, mm -hmm. then you have a problem here. Yeah. But the nuances here in the GCC, people take debt for car loans because the government sponsors education. Education is free right. in, in most Gulf countries. In the Levantine countries, that's what they are looking at. They, they want student loans to be able to progress in life. But, you know, you should have the ability to pay. I mean, even in the United States, Shruti, you know that student loans is one of the biggest problems. And mm. some of these students actually spend their entire lifetime yeah. paying back those loans. Yeah. You know, but at least it gives them a, a means to progress in life. Mm. So I, I would look at debt as not a bad thing, but you need to have a balance. You cannot live uh, on debt alone. So, sure. So that's, that's just the only nuance we look at. Uh, but, you know, you, as you can see, the rest of it, is about uh, real needs, you know, student loans, medical bills, home mortgages. Yeah. But these are 18 to 24 year olds, you mm -hmm. know. So, you know, if they get into debt early in life, as, yeah. as they are, for things that they probably don't need, uh, like excessive shopping or credit card debt, then, yeah. then you have a problem of 
uh, of, uh, of, of a culture that will be a problem for the future for these young people. But it's also that the system over here, considering the banking and other financial infrastructure, it's sort of encouraging that. And I'm talking about the GCC because that's where we've seen it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm 25, at 22 I had a car loan. <laughs> I didn't really need a car, but I did have one. Yeah. So it's because it, there is that sort of you know push towards it, yes. isn't there? There is. I think, uh, I think uh, it's sometimes, especially in the Gulf countries, it's, it's easier to get a loan and that's why people you know, sometimes live on credit card <laughs> yeah. debt. And I think that's, uh, that's something that the banks have to look seriously yeah. and spend more time in, in using that credit for helping young people start enterprises rather than in needs that are not required. So I think, I think financial institutions, the central banks of the government, the ministries of finance need to look at a policy to be able to you know, segregate needs of young people. Sure. Yeah. But, but the debt is a, is, a, is a cultural issue, as you said. Uh, uh, but it's getting to be a point where there's a bit of concern. But uh, I, I still would urge you to look at debt as not a problem. Uh, uh, as yet. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective to be honest. Yeah. But now coming back to gender rights, uh, just for the benefit of our viewers, if you can reveal what was actually in the finding about gender rights. Oh, this was in, in, personally for me the most surprising finding. Yeah. <laughs> because in many ways it challenges the stereotype built by Western countries and Western media about uh, Arab women, mm. that they do not have the right, they are subjugated, and that's yeah. the general kind of profiling they have. And here comes a result that, uh, that or an insight that jumps at you. Mm. It says that nearly 67% of young people, young women, yeah. feel they have equal rights to men. And again, I, I remind you again, Shruti, these are 18 to 24 year old women. Yeah. Uh, and they are saying we have equal rights, and not just in the Gulf where you and I see that more young Emiratis are out there in the government. In fact, the UAE Prime Minister's office has 80% of women working there. As oh, you can, really? uh, Yes, 80% uh. of all the um, PMO staff are women. Mm. And, and, and they are looking at not just equal rights, but access to quality education. Mm -hmm. A majority of them, nearly 50 to 60% feel they have good access to quality education and equally good, um, majority of them feel they have access to good quality professional jobs. That is, is, is fantastic. But more interestingly, Shruti, is we asked the men, as you know, our sample is 50% women, 50% yeah. men. And we asked uh, women, do you think it will help the family mm -hmm. if you work full-time or part-time? Yeah. Nearly 70% plus said, yes, it will help. Okay. But interestingly, when we went to the men sample, 70% of the men said it will help the family if the woman works. Oh, really? Now, wow. Isn't that a huge change? We've been yeah. tracking this over the last 12 years, and we are seeing the young Arab youth having a completely different mindset Very about women working. Yeah. So I think, I think this is, like I said, about employment, a green shoot. This is an unbelievable green shoot. The Western press or, or, or media actually uh, uh, you know, say that 50% of the population of the region is underutilized because they don't go to work. Yeah. But look what the young people are saying. And it's for the government to create this option. But just on those lines, I think I'd read a report from ILO back in 2015 where it was said that there are 27% of the women who are a part of the workforce and 77% of men are part of the workforce. Sure. So that doesn't align with what was um, found in this survey, does it? Yeah. The survey, Shruti, is about perceptions. It's about finding out the hearts and minds of young people. Right. Some of it may not have translated to reality. Mm -hmm. But these are people who are saying, what is your point of view? What's your aspiration for today and tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So when you have this young generation who will come into the market, who have young men who feel there is good opportunity, that they want women to work, you will see this translate yeah. in, in, into a, a, a better balance uh, in gender rights mm -hmm. that you will see moving forward. As you referred earlier, the UAE federal decree that both men and women will get equal pay. Yeah. Things are changing. Sure. And I'm sure it'll change even more.
Great. Uh, and just one more thing that I would like to mention because we are running short of time. Yeah. I told you it won't feel like 30 minutes, but we've crossed the 30 minute mark. But uh, US is on the rising power list, uh, according to the findings in your survey. But I've, I've been very confused about this whole thing. Obviously, Trump has a good relationship with the Middle East, um, at least from a monetary point of view, from a business point of view. Uh, but then if you go to the US, there's just different perceptions of how Arab youth and people from the Arab nations are seen in the US. There's Islamophobia, there's racism. There have been so many of these cases coming out with the Muslim travel ban initially when he just took power. Right. So with that, how would you say Trump fits into the equation of uh, Arabs' perception of the US? Okay. Uh, uh, I think when you look at tracking data in that finding, you mm -hmm. would see that the, U the, the US was seen very positively in the last year of the Obama presidency in mm -hmm. 2016. It was its best of a year. Nearly 69% of Arab youth saw the United States as an ally. Sure. And then Trump came in 2017 and it dropped to nearly half of that. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and you know, you're absolutely. And a lot of things that you just mentioned about the, the, the Muslim ban and a lot, lot of those things that happened. Uh, and, and it further dropped in, in 18. But in 19, it picked up small, it, about 40%. Mm. But this year, it just, whoa, it went up to about 50 plus percent. Okay. And it's, it's just almost close to the Obama presidency period. Oh, wow. And remember, in our main survey, which we did in February and March, mm -hmm. was just after Qasem Soleimani's killing. And that probably may have influenced that view on the United States, because for many years, Trump has said that we want to move out. They were mm -hmm. moving out of the region. They said they want to stop getting yeah. involved in these endless wars. Yeah. So, you know, I think the Soleimani killing for the first time was a signal to the Arab world that the U.S. will stay, and they took a bold action, yeah. especially on uh, a, a power like Iran, yeah. which had uh, a quite a significant impact on how young people saw the United States. I'm deducing that, but the truth is, there's the U.S. perception as an ally has increased. Okay, it's interesting to know U.S. is becoming popular again, and very close to the elections. But one last point, Shruti, on that, I think more importantly, you should see how the foreign affairs equation is changing. Yeah. Go back 10 years, even 15 years maybe, 10 years as well. You know, the centers of power were in Cairo, mm. in Baghdad, in Damascus. Yeah. These were the big powers where foreign relations that, you know, the, the, uh, the what is called the spheres of influence worked. Mm -hmm. But look at it now in 2020, the, neither Baghdad nor Cairo nor, uh, in fact, Damascus are no longer relevant in yeah. today's uh, power structure. Sure. It's Riyadh and it's Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So, you know, you see foreign relations have changed and that's why young people have seen the UAE as the number one ally followed by Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Egypt's still there as an ally. Mm -hmm. and as a power, of course. But uh, you see that equation is changing. Sure. I think uh, you will see young people more depend more on their own rather than proxy powers uh, outside the region or non-Arab uh, countries, including Turkey and Iran and Russia and, and of course, the United States. But speaking of relations, we can't not talk about uh, the UAE-Israel deal, the Abraham Accord. Um, I want to know how the Arabs feel about it. Uh, I'm sure there have been mixed sentiments, but what are they leaning more towards in this sphere? Uh, that, that the, the peace accord uh, came much uh, later uh, when we went into the COVID survey. Obviously, it was not there in our main survey as yeah, well. Yeah. Something we will look at in our next survey for sure. Yeah. But I think that's a step that positions UAE as a major uh, foreign power uh, yeah. in terms of taking the lead on something like that. I'm sure there'll be mixed feelings, but that's something we will look at in next year's self. Because I think even in the list of things that people wanted to discuss, or the Arab youth wanted to discuss, Palestine-Israel issue was one of them. I think the fourth point was it. Yes. So, yeah, it must be interesting to find out about what they feel about this deal. But yeah. thanks so much, Sunil, for joining us here. Uh, great, great insights from the Arab youth survey. We've got so much content for Raven Business uh, from the survey we've done. And it was a pleasure talking to you today. Enjoyed talking to you as well. And thank you for... Uh, uh, building so much awareness about these findings. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching AB Live. We will be back again next Tuesday.